Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And this morning we will finish our walk through the fruit of the Spirit. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that Bible and make it your own as a gift from us to you. It's very important that you have your very own Bible. While you're flipping there, I had a friend in high school named Michael, and uh, on his birthday, going into his senior year, he got a brand new Mustang GT, cherry red, and that 5.0 engine, that car was beautiful, and it was fast. All right, now it started out fast, and Michael, like any red-blooded teenage boys made it his mission to just make it even faster, all right? Never safer, always faster, okay? And first, it was small things like intake and exhaust, just adding 10, 20 horsepower here and there. Uh, But then it got real serious. And if you know what NOS is, nitrous oxide, you can can install this little system in your car that you push a button and it inserts nitrous oxide into the engine, which burns at a faster rate than normal gasoline. And it is like this super boost, okay? And uh, it's this massive explosion of power. All right, so now we're talking quarter mile time, street racing, and all sorts of crazy things. And then one day I woke to the news that Michael had uh, rolled his car. He was going entirely too fast around a turn. He totaled the car and he was lucky to be alive. You see, all that power and speed is nothing if you can't control it. The final fruit of the Spirit that we're going to be looking at this morning is self-control. That part of what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God as God's character becomes ours in all the ways that we've talked about, in addition to that, okay, is that This internal battle that we all have in terms of you still have the flesh as a Christian, but the spirit is inside of you, is that the spirit gives you the ability to overcome and to walk out in newness of life in self-control. That's what it means to be led by the spirit is to also produce self-control. Now, None of you want to hear this sermon today. I promise you. For that matter, I don't particularly want to give it. That said, uh, this sermon is, it's going to be challenging. So let me just tell you up front. Because of where our culture is with this idea of self-control, I need to spend a large chunk at the very beginning just talking about really the foundations of truth and the way that those have been rocked culturally so that we can understand self-control and the way that the Bible gives us the spirit, but that it's, it's basically how you deal with these warring desires inside of you. All right? So I say all that to say, roll up your sleeves now. It's, it's going to be a little difficult because we're going to look at where we are culturally. So listen, as I read in Galatians 5, I'm going to pick up in verse 16, because I want to show you this entire context in Galatians 5 about the flesh warring or wrestling with the spirit. (laughs) But I say, walk by the spirit. And you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. 
which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, uh, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here we are this morning with our last one, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Will you pray with me? (coughs) Our Heavenly Father, Uh, This morning, it is our deepest desire. God, we have set aside time this Sunday morning for us to gather together, to worship your name, to pray together, and to open your word so that you might renew our minds, so that through your spirit, you might convict us. Father, right now, we welcome you to convict us. We welcome you to... to to sharpen the way that we think and to expose ways that are not like you. We have sung that you are our king and that includes the way that we think and view life. Teach us reality, not according to our culture, not according to our flesh or our own desires, but according to you. And we surrender, we submit to you. And so we beg for you to shape us and that we would leave here this morning more looking more like you. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. In 1992, Hollywood was rocked by a pretty wild scandal at the time involving Woody Allen. He's the famed comedian, writer, movie producer. He had been in a long-time relationship, 12 years, with another beautiful actress named Mia Farrow. Now, even though they never married, Woody and Mia, they had one biological child together, and the couple had also adopted two children together. Now, Mia, previously to that, had also adopted children of her own. Well, in 1992, it came out that Woody left Mia for one of Mia's adopted children, Sun Yi. Woody was 56, and the young lady was 22. Stepfather became lover, and they would one day marry. Now, in 92, this was quite a scandal. I don't know if it would be anymore, but sitting down with a journalist... And that journalist begins to press uh, Alan about it. He refused to admit any wrongdoing. And as the journalist presses him, he comes out with what would be this famous line where he says, the heart wants what it wants. There is no logic to those things. You meet someone, you fall in love, and that's that. Now, as I told you at the beginning, I'm going to begin with some social commentary, okay? And this is a perfect example of where we are culturally and how we view our internal impulses. The heart wants what it wants. Hey, above all else, you be true to you. Just follow your heart, And little do we know how radical these statements are, how out of step they are with the rest of human history. Western culture has been massively uh, shaped by two godless behavioral psychologists from the early 20th century. The first of which is B.F. Skinner. Okay, I don't have a lot of time to spend on him, uh, but... Coming out of a Darwinian mindset, all right, that we are nothing but evolved apes. B.F. Skinner tied everything down to the environment, okay? We are animals. All we operate off of are instincts in response to our environment, okay? Control the environment, you guarantee the outcome. 
It's a cause and effect thing. All right? If the, if the, if the uh, behavior is not what is desired, the problem is the environment. Now, as I look at our culture, particularly the way that we parent and the way that we raise children, I mean, we are overwhelmingly influenced by this idea of just control the environment. Years ago, Lane was teaching and she had a parent-teacher conference and she begins to address the parent by saying, hey, little Johnny is really disruptive in class, only to be met with like this resistance of like, well, what are you doing to make him be disruptive in class? Now, the second godless man that has greatly influenced our Western culture, like few others, is Sigmund Freud. Okay, building off the work of Darwin and Nietzsche, Freud believed all right, that as animals, our most important desire was seeking sexual pleasure. That even the key to human existence is sexual fulfillment. Now, this is a fundamental shift from all previous philosophy that had gone prior to Freud, right? Previous to that, sex was an activity, but not fundamental to human identity. And even though Freud's psychological theories have been disproven and almost categorically rejected, his cultural influence cannot be overstated. So for Freud, repression of any true pleasure any seeking of desire, that is the cause of unhappiness. Think of what he's actually saying, that like animals, you are driven by your desire for pleasure and the definition of suffering and the source of unhappiness is to repress those true desires. The heart wants what it wants. But think about the cause or, or, or what this shift does. What it does is it shifts truth from any external source, okay? Any outside authority like God or the Bible or even tradition of culture as it's been passed down from your parents. It shifts that truth from external to internal, inside each individual, Right? We're all animals just driven by our instincts. And all wants become needs, even a duty. You must follow your heart and be true to yourself. You need to be authentic. You need to find your most authentic self, true self. That's the highest value. And then the culture becomes fascinated with how everyone feels. Now, this is utterly ridiculous because we are filled with competing desires. We are filled with competing desires, right? I want to be generous with my money and give it to the poor, and I want to drive a really nice car. I want to be physically fit and eat whatever I want. I want to be faithful and true to my wife and my family and objectify women. Inside each of us, we have so many competing desires. But there, there, if individuals are the ones who define truth, it would seem that instant gratification would always rise to the top and went out. And that higher values would vanish. And so we look around at our culture and we say, my God, why are we so confused? I mean, seriously, pause and consider. Okay, all of this freedom movement. Okay, in a moment, I'm going to talk about the sexual revolution. So I'm including that. But I mean all of this freedom movement. It's march towards freedom. That that. To define freedom as to do whatever you want. Oh, if we could get there, then we would be free. This monumental shift of moving truth from external to internal. Serious question. Where has this left us? 
I mean, because we're more anxious, depressed, suicidal, medicated, confused people than ever. All right, and if you're here this morning and you're struggling with those things, listen, as your pastor, I need to be very careful. I am not saying that your issue isn't real or that this is the cause, okay? I'm not speaking to you as an individual. I'm talking at the 30,000 foot. I'm giving social commentary because it is right for us to ask, why have we become so anxious? And you could give a hundred reasons for that, right? Technology, social media. I'm not saying this is, but I would say the Bible would argue that primarily it is your source of truth. The Bible would say that you primarily operate out of your belief system, right? Not your instincts, that God has made you in his image and, and that the, the highest function of you is you are operating out of your beliefs. There are tons of books on this as, as you begin to look at what's going on in our culture, one of which is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by uh, Carl Truman. That's where I'm getting a lot of this that I'm saying to you. I want to end this section with a quote from Cornelius Planiga in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. He says this, in such a culture, that's a Freudian culture, and in the throes of such fascination, that is fascination with our feelings, the self exists to be explored, indulged, and expressed but not disciplined or restrained. And yet the very thing that Jesus requires, that if you want to be a follower of him, if anyone wants to come after me, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Right In complete contrast, the Bible says that you have a part of you called the flesh, the flesh, and that is your corrupt, fallen nature. It's sinful, it's harmful, and it must be denied. And before you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are dead in those desires of the flesh. And even after salvation, that through salvation, God has removed your heart of stone and put in you a heart that can beat for him and you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, but the flesh still remains. And that the complexity of who you are is that now as a Christian, you have spirit and flesh that are warring inside of you. And you still have to Deal with the flesh. The Bible would say you are now free to follow Jesus, that you're no longer enslaved, no longer bound to follow the flesh, that the Spirit has set you free to a relationship with Jesus. That's the entire context of what's going on here in Galatians 5. Okay, You can see it right there in the text in verse 17. He says, look at it, how... The flesh is against the spirit, how they are in opposition to one another. Now, these are the deeds of the flesh. And you read that list and you're like, that's our nightly news. But the fruit of the spirit, right? It's life giving. It's love, joy, peace. Okay. All right. So that's the end of the cultural dialogue. All right, you kind of shake that off, okay? I know it's headsy this morning. Here's the deal. It's so important for us to be able to understand what's going on culturally, and I needed to make that point in terms of the Bible is, is really the battleground where Satan attacks is at the foundation of truth, who you are in your inner core. You're either... A, made in the image of God, and, and, and this is your complex being, or you're just an animal with instincts, okay? Now, we're almost to self-control,
But there's one other really important point that I need to make. Now I'm playing in the space of once you've adopted a biblical worldview, okay, and you begin to ask the question, how does the Spirit produce the fruit of self-control inside me? Okay? So I want you to notice, one, how much space in here is given to this battle between the flesh and the spirit. You see that? His whole argument is like, look, you have both natures inside of you, and they are wrestling. And then I want you to notice also, listen to the words that he uses. Walk by the spirit, verse 16. Be led by the spirit, verse 18. Live by the Spirit, verse 25. Follow the Spirit or be in step with the Spirit, verse 25. And I want you to notice how all of those words involve you. So much of my life, I viewed abiding in the Spirit as an experience or feeling. Right? Probably because you, know, you can experience God in, in worship and prayer, even in your quiet time. And when the Lord fills you up, like it's this, like you can experience God. There's a personal relationship. Okay? But here's the learning part just because we can experience God in those ways does not mean that that's what it means to abide in Christ. You see, abiding isn't a feeling of being close to God. Why? Because the battle over the flesh and self-control doesn't work that way. Okay, when temptation hits, you know what I feel like doing? The sin. That's the definition of temptation. That's all I feel like doing is the sin. Right? I want to overindulge. I don't really feel like getting out of my bed to pray every morning. Right? There's not this, the alarm goes off and suddenly there's this overflowing cup moment of, oh, oh, the spirit has filled me. Now I want to get out of bed and, and go spend time with the Lord. Right? No, usually it's this entire argument in my mind of why God will still love me as I hit the snooze button for 12 times. That's usually what's going on in my heart because I don't feel like getting up early, okay? And for so long, because I was waiting for the feelings, I was defeated because I said, well, then I'm not abiding because I can't feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, that's not how it works, okay? Those those Holy Spirit experiences are great. Praise God for them. But that's not how it works in the realm of self-control and overcoming the flesh, okay? Here's what the Bible would say. Say, one, That the spirit has broken the chains of the flesh and you are no longer enslaved. You are no longer bound. You no longer must obey the flesh. So those chains have been broken. Two, the spirit will flood your heart with motivation periodically, right? Where you're filled with hope. You're filled with God's promises. You can experience him. There are those breakthrough moments where the Spirit begins to motivate you. Three, the Bible is after your mind and the way that you think, okay? So that you would be able to see clearly and understand things the way God says they are. And once you can do that, at the end of the day, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice on whether for your spirit to be lock and step with God's spirit. And if you you think that the Holy Spirit is just going to magically 
because of great feelings produce self-control in your life, you're very sorely mistaken, right? There's not going to be an overwhelming Holy Spirit moment when the alarm goes off at 5 a.m. Listen to Romans 12, 2, because he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. Do you see that? Did you know that something God wants to work in your life is so that you will be transformed so that you start to act like God and think like God and make the same choices that Jesus would do so that you can prove what the will of God is. He he wants to take you from a baby to someone who makes your own choices. Right? Jesus is the ultimate picture of being led by the Spirit, crouched in the garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, I do not want to do this, but I will do it because it's your will. See, there, there was no Spirit, oh, this really feels good right now. I will do it because it's your will. See, the final fruit of the Spirit, evidence that God is working inside of you, is that self-control will be produced. All right, so pastor, why the long introduction on this? Well, guys, because this is where we are culturally and we greatly struggle with the idea of self-control and what do we do with urges inside of us that do not line up with the word of God. Furthermore, let's just put all cards on the table. In a society that's as affluent as us, that has so much progress and technology, we've become very comfortable. And we view things through the lens of what is most comfortable. And self-control is the exact enemy of comfort. You will struggle with self-control. Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. In the ancient world, a city's primary defense was its outer wall. And if you didn't have an outer wall, if that was broken down, then you could be attacked from an enemy any time, from any direction. You had no defense. You are completely vulnerable and defenseless. And here the Bible says that is what it's like for a Christian to not have self-control. You are wallless, completely vulnerable from spiritual attacks from an enemy who wishes to devour you and entice your flesh. So what is self-control? Three things real quickly, then we're done. One, it is the power to stop. The power to stop. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to regulate our desires and appetites, preventing their excess. Preventing their excess. God has made us to experience pleasure in this life in incredible, amazing ways. Like, you need to know that my favorite dessert on the whole planet is tiramisu cheesecake. I told you last week that I love coffee, that I'm a coffee snob. I actually got gifts of coffee this week. So I'm kind of hoping that if you're taking notes, right, Christmas is coming Tiramisu cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. I love it because it combines coffee and cheesecake. Some of my favorite things. It puts, oh my goodness. Oh, I could indulge on some tiramisu cheesecake, right? When it hits your mouth, it's just magnificent. I, when I eat, I eat with dessert in mind, okay? My, I, I choose, hey, where do you want to go eat? I'm thinking the whole time, like, well, who has the best dessert? That's where I really want to go, right? So, so that's how I function. Listen, we all have a tendency to overindulge. God has made us to experience pleasures, but we all struggle with knowing when to stop. Am I alone on this? Am I preaching to myself? You can raise your hand. If you have the struggle to overindulge, just put your hand up high. If your hand is not up, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. 
We all struggle with overindulging. We have a tendency to make good things become God things in life, right? Our priorities get all mixed up in our hearts, and we chase these desires to unhealthy levels, like sleep, food, sex, Netflix, video games. Hey, hear me. Video games are good. They are fun. If I let my boys, they would play video games 12 hours a day, and then just wake up and do it all again. Okay? If you let them go to sleepovers, all they do is play video games all night long. No ability to stop. Even social media. Do you understand that social media is programmed to be addictive? Are you, they have all these studies. This is hardwiring your brain to be addictive. I once counseled a lady who checked her bank account five times a day because it was this obsessive control issue. Listen, anything can become an idol of the heart and not, just be, and not just cause you to not seek God. It can cause you to get all sorts of priorities out of order from your family, your marriage, and what you're doing at work, all of these things out of order. The Bible says, as Paul does in Philippians 3.19, right? The, the, the people of this world, their God is their appetite, But the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, empowers you to stop and to reprioritize. The Spirit evidence is you have the ability to draw lines. Secondly, the fruit of the Spirit, or what self-control means, is also the power to say no. That is to lead your desires. We all have desires that the Bible says are corrupt and evil. In fact, one of the things that Jesus does on the Sermon on the Mount is he presses external behavior and he presses it down to the heart. He says, look, you you think you're doing well because you haven't murdered someone. But I say to you, if, if you are harboring resentment and this anger in your heart, well, that's where murder comes from and you've sinned in your heart. Look, you think you've done great because you haven't committed adultery, but I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has committed adultery, okay? All of us are filled with a desire, corrupt desires, okay? This is where Jesus is so different from the world, right? The sexual revolution of the 60s said, if we could just make freedom from restraint, if we could define freedom as don't give me any restraints, let us do whatever we want, then we'd be happy. And yet you look around at what's happening culturally, Even in in the world of of what's happening with dating and and sexuality, the pornography hookup culture is producing even more violence and a misogynistic culture than ever was before. I read an article this week by a liberal feminist from from the UK, okay? Not a Christian. The, uh, the article, the title was The Sexual Revolution Has Failed Gen X Women. And I, I want to read a quote because the, the author is so disillusioned with the, with the playbook that always comes out of the sexual revolution. It is this. They prescribe more and more freedom and are continually surprised when their prescription doesn't cure the disease. Because the the world says, just if you could throw off all restraints, then I'd be happy. And Jesus doesn't say give in to those sinful desires because they define you. Instead, the New Testament would say the opposite. That the cross has broken the chains that force you to follow. And instead, with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit, you now have the ability to lead yourself out of those desires to lead your mind, to lead your emotions, to even lead your speech. 
Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence or if anything worthy of praise, think or dwell on these things. That as Christians, we're commanded to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And thirdly, as we're asking the question, self-control, what is it? So, so self-control is the, is the power to stop. Self-control is the power to say no and to lead your desires. And, and thirdly, self-control is the power to go. And what I mean by that is, listen, self-control means having the ability to do things that are good even when you don't want to. Right to do what is good and right for you even when you don't want to. We call these things discipline, right? The discipline of your body, exercise. Sometimes one of the most spiritual things that you can do is go on a jog in your neighborhood, is get some exercise. Or the discipline of your emotions to be able to address issues that need dealing with. Or spiritual disciplines like prayer and fasting and confession. Did you know I have never once said, I want to fast? This seems like a really fun thing to do. Because you're exercising self-control over the flesh and it's war. You are saying to your body, I am not my appetite. I am a spiritual being. That is my highest priority, and I will seek that above even good, given, godly desires. I will repress those so that I I am first a spiritual being, because I am not my appetite. Right? You're saying, I don't want to, but I do. And you hear that, and you're like, that doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? To say, I don't want to, but I do. Well, it doesn't sound very spiritual. And we're in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says, I beat my body and make it my slave. But it actually is spiritual. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Having the ability to choose what is right, even when you don't feel like it, is evidence that Jesus is working in me. All right, I know this has been a challenging sermon and a challenging series. I wanna close this sermon with uh, just a story about fruit of the Spirit and what it can look like uh, in action. Truthfully, we can learn a great deal from our brothers and sisters around the world, especially those in the persecuted church. Sometimes we like to think that we're the mature ones that have so much to give and offer to the rest of the world, but oftentimes it is actually in reverse. This story is out of the book Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin. He was out visiting uh, the, the rural church way out in, in China, rural part of China. And as he's dialoguing and interacting with them, uh, they lived their entire lives in seclusion. They, they had no clue what it was like on other sides of the world. He, he told them about, uh, about our Christian bookstores. This is back when we had Christian bookstores like Lifeway, right? And, and he, he would just describe, like, you know, you can go into the store and there are like hundreds of Bibles that you can just pick up and look. And there are hundreds of all. And they were so amazed. They just began to rejoice with this concept that there is a place like that in this world. How awesome. And they rejoiced. And then he also told, uh, told them how many Americans and other Christians around the world pray for them. And they just began to weep with unthinkable joy because the gift of being prayed for by other Christians on the other side of the world. And then Nick began to tell them that there are other parts in the world like the Middle East that have it just as bad, if not worse, than what they have. And he could see their countenance, just kinda the mood completely change. 
He awoke the next day to the sound of what he thought was screaming and crying and possibly a police raid. Do you know he's startled out of his sleep? It's very early in the morning. His mind immediately is like, are the police coming? And he walked out to find that the church had vowed to get up an hour early every morning, and they were crying out in prayer, in prayer for the Muslim background believers that Nick had told them about the previous day. They found out there were other Christians who were persecuted as bad, if not more than them, and they immediately got up an hour early every day to pray for them. The fruit through the power of the spirit of self-control. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, father, as we have done a lot of mental exercise this morning and tried to think critically and well about your word and what you are producing in us, that through your spirit, as our will comes alongside, we are able to walk out and control our passions and our desires and seek you and focus on you and even develop disciplines in our lives. God, help us to walk like that. Help us to be challenged and changed this morning. Help us to have a moment of resolve where we say, you know what, God, whether I feel like it or not, I will choose you. And I will wake up for prayer or for discipline, even exercise of my body, because I want to walk out in self-control because your spirit is producing this in me. Please, God, show us how to walk completely different from the world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.